Thank you everybody for joining us. We're gonna wait a couple more minutes and let everybody get into the webinar and we will be beginning shortly. And thank you for joining us again. Our webinar will be beginning soon. I wanna take a moment to just talk about some of the upcoming courses that we have available here at COEHCE. On Wednesday, May 19th, we partnered with Thomas Girding, MPH, and the University of Cincinnati ERC for a free webinar on an investigation of home ergonomics issues experienced by university faculty and students during COVID-19. And that is going to be at noon on Wednesday, May 19th, uh, Pacific time. On Wednesday, June 2nd, we are hosting a webinar called Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder and Intensive Care Unit Nurses, Finding, Findings of a Concept Analysis with Paula Levi, BSN RN. If you wanna see a list of our upcoming webinars, visit us at coeh.berkeley.edu backslash about CE. It looks like we have people coming in, great. So on behalf of the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health, I would like to welcome you to our webinar, Managing Stress and Building Resilience Among School Employees, presented by Michelle Mariscal and Yasin Khan. Thank you both for joining us. A few housekeeping items first. You will be muted during this presentation. If you'd like to ask a question, please enter into the online Q&A box instead of the chat. We will save time at the end of the presentation to address any questions as much as we can. This presentation is being recorded and will be made available on the COEH um, YouTube page, and you will also get a recording tomorrow. All participants who logged in with their registration email for the full live presentation today will receive an email tomorrow with a link to the recording, an evaluation form, and that will qualify participants for a certificate of completion worth one continuing education contact hour. Once the evaluation has been completed, you will be able to access and print or save your certificate. And at this time, I would love to present our um, presenters. So first we have Michelle Mariscal. Michelle has 30 years experience in the health and wellness field. She is a skilled facilitator in soft skills training and development, consulting with 35 public school districts to find resilience through risk mitigation prevention strategies. She's also the owner of Energy M. As an advanced grief recovery specialist, she helps people complete the emotional pain of loss. She's a five-time author, with, most of her re with her most recent publication being Growing Through Grief, The Alchemy of Healing from Loss. Um, and then our second presenter, who actually is going first today, is gonna be Yasin Khan. Yasin graduated with her MPH with a concentration in environmental and occupational safety from Drexel University. Through the Occupational Health and Safety Internship Program, Yasin's worked with SEIU Local 121RN and the Nurse Alliance of California on regulatory research for the California Safe Care Standard which was adopted by California Occupational Health and Safety Standards Board in 2016. Yasin has continued to work on OHS issues in a variety of industries, including firefighters and airport workers nationally, as well as with tailors and tea farmers in India. She now works as the program coordinator at UC Berkeley's Labor Occupational Health Program. So thank you both again for joining us. And I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Yasin to go ahead and start. Great, thank you so much, Jessica. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen and then get started. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, yes we can see it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, so for today, we are going to be talking about workplace stress. Um, and the way that we are splitting up this presentation today is that I'm going to start out by talking about the root causes of some of the root causes of workplace stress and um, some different collective action solutions to address them. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle to really help us figure out like how can we take care of ourselves um, as we are fighting for those kind of longer term solutions to the stress that we experience at work. Okay, so when we are thinking about our bodies, um, stress is something that is impacting basically every single system in our body. And um, 
our bodies react to stressors in ways that can help us to cope and react quickly in the short run because our bodies gear up for a fight or fight um, uh, reaction to help us respond quickly. And it uses its resources um, to kind of have that immediate action, but it does that by slowing down non-essential functions for that moment. And so if this happens once in a while, um, or it, it happens in a way that is mild, then our body can cope with, with that kind of level of stress more easily. But it becomes a really big problem when stress is chronic, it's happening all the time, our bodies um, what happens then is that our bodies remain in this constant state of alert. Um, and then we see in the slide all kinds of different um, issues that can um, sort of evolve from that. So for example, um, when your body perceives a threat, your central nervous system produces stress, the stress hormones of adrenaline and cortisol. And um, Sorry, I just have to move this over. Okay. Um, so the stress hormones of adrenaline and cortisol, which increase your heartbeat to get blood to your muscles to take action. But when this happens chronically, it can cause diseases related to high blood pressure and increase your risk for stroke or heart attacks. Another example is that your liver produces extra blood sugar or glucose to give you a boost of energy to again, react really quickly. But when this is happening chronically, then it increases the risk of developing type two diabetes. Similarly, your muscles tense up when we're stressed out to kind of be ready for that action. But if that's happening all the time, then that can cause headaches, neck pain, shoulder pain, and all kinds of other body aches. Um, so again, stress is stimulating our immune system in the short run, but over time, stress hormones can weaken the immune system, which is gonna make it more likely that you're gonna get sick um, and increases the time that it's gonna take to recover. Chronic stress can also contribute to anxiety and depression. So this is kind of like a really quick general overview of all of these different um, negative impacts that chronic stress can have. So next, we are going to talk a little bit about how to um, actually identify the stressors that are occurring in workplaces and think about strategies that can address them both at the collective level and the individual level. Um, and just to kind of, um, so I think stress can feel like it's, it's, it's always going to be there, right? Or it's kind of, it can feel um, like it is, it is sort of like a necessary part of the job, but it's absolutely not, right? And um, as we go through this presentation, we're gonna be talking a lot about different kinds of solutions and, and really like how to make sure that we're, um, we're protecting our, ourselves and our bodies and all these different functions um, from this sort of chronic stress. Okay, so now we are going to do a quick poll um, of what are some of the root causes of stress in your own workplace. So if we could launch that poll, thank you so much. And I'll just give folks a minute to respond. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So I can see here that about 21% said low pay is a root cause. 27% uh, said unpredictable scheduling. 58%, this is the largest number, um, said unrealistic workload. 13% said racism discrimination. 48% said lack of employee involvement in decision making. And 13% said unsafe working conditions. Okay, great. Thank you everyone so much for going through that. Um, we're going to be 
continuing to talk about these issues as we um, as we move forward. So thank you for participating. Okay, so the, the number one thing that people said here was um, workload issues. So this is not surprising given this graph. So this is from the Economic Policy Institute. And it shows us that um, since 1948, the rate of productivity for American workers has just continued to rise while hourly wage um, has, has really stagnated. Um, and so when we think about um, the amount of work that people are having to put in for um, depreciating wages, right, while every, the cost of everything else is going up, um, you can really understand why workers are experiencing so much workplace stress and strain. And when we think about school employees specifically, um, we see that there's also a really high rate of injuries among school employees. And so this um, chart is, is um, it shows us in the, in the blue um, bar is California um, employees of all industries and the overall industry rate uh, for 100 full-time employees. And then in the orange bar, we see what that same rate is for school employees and it's much higher. And so this, this first um, year is 2008, the second year is 2017. And so we can see that the numbers are, have, are coming down for both, um, but it's still, it's still much higher, right? It's, it's a huge issue. And so um, the SASH program, the safety for uh, safety action for school and health, for safety and health, whoo, sorry. <laughs> um, this program that is co-sponsoring this webinar um, is exactly um, sort of pitted to address these issues because we know that school employees in particular are experiencing this really high rate of injuries. And when we say school employees, who are we talking about? So folks automatically always think of teachers, of course, but also bus drivers, janitorial workers, the maintenance and operation folks, paraeducators, cafeteria workers, the office administration folks, right? So when we're talking about schools, we really wanna take a holistic um, approach at who is in schools and what are they experiencing? And when we think about um, workplace injuries and how they factor into stress, this is a huge deal, right? We're all seeing this with COVID-19, of course, during the pandemic, how stressful it is um, to be working in conditions where we, we are very worried about our, our health. And we know from this graph that um, the rate of injury is also very high among school employees. And so these are issues that we definitely want to address, of course, because with like any other occupational health and safety issue, we really wanna figure out what the root cause is and address that. So we're not just dealing with the symptoms. Um, so then if we if we kind of keep going, um, we go a little deeper and we think about like, okay, so if we know that people are getting hurt at work, we know people are getting sick at work, you know, what can we do about that? And then we come to this um, and this uh, infographic tells us that in 2020, OSHA only had one safety inspector for every 82,881 workers, right? We also know that OSHA's budget per to protect each worker only amounted to three dollars and 97 cents right so again here we're, if we're looking at the larger structure of what are american workers living through right now it makes a lot of sense that there are these extremely high levels of chronic stress because we know the productivity rates are super high pay is stagnant injuries and health um health issues are absolutely happening. OSHA is super underfunded, right? Doesn't have the resources that it needs to protect workers. Um, and then if we keep going and we think about, okay, um, what are, uh, what are ways that, uh, what are, what are other, what else is going on in people's lives, right? People have families, people have families that they need to take care of. Um, and the United States um, is actually the 
one of the only countries in the world without any kind of national paid family leave policy. I and mean, it's the only high income country that doesn't have one, right? And so again, we're seeing these, this, the, just this trend that like, yes, it makes sense that workers are, um, are experiencing so much stress. So now, now that we've covered all of that, we can start to think about, okay, so what are, what are some potential solutions? And this is just kind of a silly meme um, that I think can sort of get at how it can feel to be a worker um, who's experiencing so, like, so many different forms of stress, right? And so in this example, we've got, we've got drowning, um, drowning hard working underpaid workers who are reaching out for help. And then you see a hand coming in, that's their manager. And then instead of, you know, kind of grabbing their hand and helping to pull them out um, from drowning, they say pizza party, right? And then and then the, the person is, is drowning, right? Continues to drown. And so um, this of course is not a solution for workplace stress, right? Things like um, appreciation days or pizza parties, right? Things like those things can be really wonderful and they can definitely play a role, but they are of course not going to, um, they are not going to actually address these underlying really structural issues that workers are facing that are creating the really high levels of stress and resulting um, uh, health issues that workers are experiencing. So for for just just as like a, a very quick exercise, if folks are, are thinking like, okay, so if you and your coworkers are the drowning employees, what would it take for like what would it take to be pulled out? What would it take to, to be saved from from drowning? Right. And it might not be one hand. It might not be one manager who's who's helping to pull it out, pull, pull you out of the water, right? It could be a collective group of people. It could be collective policies. But just think for a moment about what would those policies need to look like? What are the things that would actually address the structural issues, right, of, of way, um, uh, way too high workloads, right, that people um, that are unsustainable, right, racism and discrimination in the workplace, um, a lack of equity, uh, low pay, unpredictable scheduling, right? On, and of course, with unpredictable scheduling too, there are so many ripple effects of, you know, how can you schedule a doctor's appointment for yourself or for your children if you don't know when you're supposed to be working, right? How can you have any um, downtime or decompression time if you don't know what your work schedule is going to be and you're kind of at the beck and call of an employer? So, thinking about solutions what could real solutions look like so this is um a, a kind of very broad overview of some ideas of what could address some of the root causes of workplace stress so ensuring reasonable um, and predictable hours shifts and scheduling that allow work-life balance uh, eliminating workplace harassment, promoting justice and fairness, ensuring a living wage and job security, creating a more supportive work environment, giving workers opportunities to participate in the decisions that affect their jobs, right? So these are all, these are all really, um, they sound really great, right? But, but how do we get to these solutions and what do they actually look like in practice? So, Historically, the labor movement has been the most effective vehicle in improving conditions, creating transparency and protected protections for workers. So the unionization rate um, in the US is low. If we think if we think back to that chart about productivity and wages, um, the if, if we added in another line for unionization, you would, you would see that same kind of depression happening. Um, so it's around 12% in the US for um, teachers in the US, it's actually much higher. So um, I couldn't find a statistic for, for all school employees, but in 2017 for elementary school and middle school teachers, 44.9% uh, were union members and secondary school teachers, um, that rate was 50.2%. Was, uh, um, so we see that it's higher in education. Um, and, and we also see that that can make a really big difference in workers' lives. 
So if we take a recent example, um, this is from the California Teacher Teachers Association, and we think about COVID, right? This is this was a really recent example of how um, teachers and and school employee unions were really working to make sure that their employees were being kept safe and also their students were being kept safe and the larger community, right? And so this is a really interesting graphic. I'll, I'll just read along the bottom in case it's difficult to read, but it says that there are 600,000 school employees in California, and this is all based on Department of Education um, data. There are 6,100,000 public school students in California. Um, and then when these students and, and school employees leave school, then they touch 20 million other lives outside of their school community, right? And, and that number 20 million is actually over half of the entire population of California. So we see here that schools are, are critical, right? In terms of the pandemic with this really specific example, right? When we're thinking about an infectious disease and, and kind of the, um, the level that school, schools have in terms of their community impact, but also when we think about communities in general, right? If we, can un if we can address those underlying causes of stress among school employees, what kind of positive ripple effects could that have for them, for their families, for their students, for their students' families? Um, and I think it is really exciting to be sort of focusing in on school employees as sort of a, a, a kind of turning point um, and, and a way to really address um, issues on a large kind of on a, on a large systems level. So this is a picture from um, the Chicago teacher strike. Uh, and in 2018, 2019, we did see this wave of um, teacher strikes across the country. Um, so we saw Oakland teacher strikes, right, LA, um, but also in kind of less, ex less um, places you might not expect, right? Like West Virginia, Kentucky, Oklahoma. Um, and teachers in these states were fighting for all kinds of things that um, really get at those root causes of stress in the workplace. So they were, they were fighting for and winning um, improvements in, in their pay, also lowering their classroom size, creating a more, a more supportive work environment um, by addressing, starting to address um, discrimination and racism, um, advocating for schools to hire enough workers to effectively run, including support staff like paraeducators, nurses, counselors. Um, and, and so this is a really, um, a, a kind of really positive example. And with COVID-19, of course, we've seen across so many different industries of workers really coming together and saying, like, we are going to make a change and we are going to make our workplaces better and safer, right? And in doing that, you're, you're addressing um, a lot of those kind of core stressors. Um, but of course, these are not quick solutions. So in the meantime, what can we do, right? While we're working towards structural change, what can we do to keep ourselves healthy? Um, how can we find ways to, to cope with the individual stress that we're experiencing, right? These are all really important questions. And for that, I am going to turn um, the presentation over to Michelle. Great, thank you, Yasin. All right, let's see. Um... My screen shared. Ooh, so everybody just take a breath. I'm gonna start modeling um, <laughs> what I'm going to be sharing. Uh, just bring all of your attention and awareness to the area of your heart. And just imagine that the air can flow in and out from that space. So just taking a pause. And as you see on the screen, here we go. Um, just take a second now to, to notice where are your thoughts? What are your thoughts focused on? And if you have a piece of paper there in front of you, also notice what emotions, what emotions are associated with those thoughts? 
And this in itself is a tool. There's, there's been a lot of work in the last five to 10 years out of UCLA, Dr. Matthew Lieberman has really shown us that just noticing and naming your thoughts can help us move if, if we're in some of these fear, uh, some of our limbic system that stores patterns of worry and fear, we can actually move those brain signals forward to the prefrontal cortex, which is where we are wanting to operate when we want to make good decisions and say, say things that we actually want to say. <laughs> All right. So also on the screen, you notice that there, there's a picture of a battery. And so what we're going to be talking about is very specific to emotions and recognizing at any given time, am I charging my battery or am I drained? And if so, what can I do about it? So that's really our goal is to have tools to, to do something about that. And uh, this information that I'm bringing to you today is from the Institute of Heart Math. They are uh, a research institute as well as they have lots of tools. I'll be um, giving you a, a tool later that you can actually download. I, um, but anyway, their uh, research has been published in many different fields. So they have a whole host of evidence-based uh, tools and research and information for us to learn from. And one of them is this idea that resilience, while most of us may think of it as bouncing back from something, what's really powerful to understand is that we can be building capacity throughout the day. So when we look at that picture of the battery, we really do have an ability if we start checking in with ourselves more often during the day and asking that question, what are my thoughts and what are these emotions that are associated with that? We can make choice. And that's really what we wanna understand about being able to build a capacity for resilience when we are, when, when we are moving with so many of these um, you know, difficult life situations, difficult work situations. So this, this picture on the screen just helps us understand that when we take an action in any one of these different areas, um, some of you um, may have practices that you do in all these different areas that help you maintain resilience. And that word in the, in the middle, coherence, that's a word that HeartMath uses to describe a state in which you're alert and calm at the same time. You are, you are alert and able to make good decisions, have very good communication, and you're, you are staying calm at the same time. So it's a very particular state in the body that in all their research, they've been able to show that the immune system, the nervous system, and the hormonal system can all sync up. So remember that first slide that talked about all the different effects in uh, the physical body. Uh, there's a flow down from all of the stress that first hits at that nervous system level and then creates a cascade of up to 1400 biochemical changes in your body. So when we look at these different domains, you know, let's talk about when, when we're doing something on that physical level that can really help us stay safe. I know for myself, when I'm very stressed and distracted, I, on more than one occasion have I kicked my toe on the curb, like just not paying attention. <laughs> and again, when we talk about injuries in the workplace, we want to recognize that all of these pieces have an impact. So remaining injury free, um, having uh, higher levels of sa uh, safety and remaining energized. So that's that physical level when we do things in that physical level, emotional flexibility, that really helps us be able to 
see that we, we do have some level of choice about how we're reacting to stress. And uh, as you see their positive outlook, that may not always be the easiest thing to do, but at least in situations that are difficult, if we can find that, yes, even though this is, is difficult and this isn't going the way that I want it, there are these other things that are going well. And you can see how that creates a different kind of harmony in our teams rather than consistently focusing and, and being in these emotions of hopelessness and helplessness. And then spiritual flexibility, absolutely helping us to be able to invite and listen to multiple perspectives and have tolerance. So lots of um, impact on us personally, but also um, in our teams. And then uh, that mental flexibility, really being able to make good decisions. So let's uh, take a look a little further uh, about stress. It, it really is true that we're constantly putting out energy and we need to pay attention to resting and recovering, whatever that means for us. And I always like to talk about this idea that stress, is, many of us um, do thrive on a certain amount of stress. So let's talk about that because there, there is a point where we have maximum efficiency. We are just humming along when there's deadlines and, and we can really apply ourselves, things are going well, but then there comes this hyperreactive stage. And that's the point where we need to pay attention when that starts happening because it can lead to emotional exhaustion. So what we want to do is shift that, that curve so that we're noticing and using our tools. And again, here are some of the things that we report that HeartMath, when they did their studies, reported as stressors. And in our poll right here in the audience, unrealistic workload, number one, lack of um, involvement in decision making. So what do we do? What do we do when we're faced with that? Again, looking at how we can create choice points for ourselves and recognizing that our emotional states are constantly humming in the background and uh, HeartMath names it um, emotional soundtracks. So if you've ever gotten a, a, a song stuck in your head <laughs> and it's, all, it's there all day long, it just keeps popping up. It's like that. So go back to the exercise where I asked asked you to look at and think about and name your thoughts and the emotions that you were having. If you are having emotions that are draining you, those are the ones that we want to be able to recognize. Oh, there I am again. There I am again. So what we know from the research is that depleting emotions do all these um, all these things that are not good. Who needs more brain cell death? <laughs> not me. All right. So really recognizing that we know that staying in these chronic levels of fear and frustration, which uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I am glad I have known about and, and have these tools to be able to use um, because it's really important to recognize the connection uh, for you personally about what's going on so that you can in, improve and manage your own health, but then also recognize that that then has an effect at what's happening for you at work. So this is a graph from the, the um, it, it, it's kind of a famous piece of research that points out why we want to pay attention to these chronic emotions that are depleting us. 
So imagine that you're at work and there's a conversation that gets a little heated and something is said that gets under your skin. What this graph is showing is heart rate on the left there. Uh, and you know our heart rates beat anywhere from 60 to 90 beats per minute. And notice the rise, the rise as um, that, that argument starts and then notice how high it gets. Any of you who are exercisers out there might recognize 140 beats per minute. That's what happens when I ride my bike or do my run. So, and this is while you're sitting or standing. So you can begin to see why our body begins to have all this impact. And then the really important piece of this is if we don't do something to bring that physiology back down, we're then maintaining that physiological state. So just taking a look that this is an extended period of time, they cut off the tracking at 60 minutes, but certainly it probably went on and on. So imagine taking that soundtrack now into the next interaction with your teammate. So what we then know about uh, renewing emotions are all of these great things that we want to be able to have. Um, certainly longevity and resilience. And notice, you know, some of the names of those emotions. And I like that HeartMath started using the word renewing versus positive, uh, because quite frankly, in the face of some things that we are managing in our emotional life, it's kind of hard to be positive. <laughs> but if we can call up courage, if we can have an appreciation of something, even if it's a small something, uh, if we can draw up this sense of tolerance in us, just maybe ask ourselves, what am I learning in this? This is really hard. What am I learning? Um, because I don't, I don't want it to keep feeling like this. So let me just um, see what tolerance feels like in my body and what that might change. So by being able to do that, you start plugging up some of those energy leaks. And again, when, when you do if you take that exercise on to start checking what's going on for you in your thoughts and emotions, you'll begin to notice patterns that you can start uh, cleaning up. So I am gonna take you into uh, an exercise right now. So self-awareness, as you see on the screen, self-awareness is a tool in itself, beginning to notice over the day what your thoughts and feelings are. And here's, Here's a tool from HeartMath that is, again, an evidence-based tool to help you self-regulate. And maybe if an argument or communication or even a situation at work is a difficult situation that you feel like is just having you in a chronic state of depleting emotions, we want to be able to create some sense of ease around it. And when we talk about ease, it's really to create a, a rhythm so that you can keep moving. It's not that we are not going to experience these emotions. We are absolutely, um, you know, human beings have a continuum of many different emotions. It's not that we're saying we don't want to feel them. We absolutely want to recognize what is happening that this emotion is here. What can I do about it? How can I bring ease that will bring my body into a physiological state? It is still alert. It, I, I can bring some stillness to my mental and emotional body. Just like uh, we talk about, as you see on the slide, EMTs and any first responders, this is a really necessary skill. And when we're talking about elements of safety, 
at work, really important to be able to recognize uh, if you are in an escalating emotion and that you want to be able to be alert, but you, you need to bring some calm for yourself um, so that you can continue to have clear communications, effective communications, and stay safe at the same time. So I am going to guide you through this now. So if you are, uh, if you're multitasking, take a moment, and give yourself two minutes to have a little inner ease. All right, so let's all just focus our attention in the area of our heart. And you're just imagining that the breath is flowing in and out of your heart or chest area. Breathing a little slower and deeper than usual. Just at a relaxed pace, try to bring softness. If you can bring some softness to your breath. And if you're noticing thoughts are still present, just invite them to move from your head on down to that heart or middle of your chest area and just let it flow out. Notice that you can do that. You don't have to hold on to those. Let them flow out. And now with each breath, Focusing your awareness in the area of your heart, draw in the feeling of inner ease to balance your mental and emotional energy. Draw in the feeling of inner ease and notice where that is for you in your body. Where does ease reside for you. And now we can set a meaningful intent to anchor this feeling of inner ease as we continue our presentation and through the day as you return to your projects, to your challenges, to your daily interactions. So those are the quick steps, heart-focused breathing, bring your awareness to the heart, draw in a feeling of inner ease, and then anchor it. And one of the things I find works really well for me is just to say the words, breathe ease, breathe ease. That's my quick step. All right, so again, this is about creating a choice point, and this is one of the most important skills that we can have. And continue to develop is recognizing that we, we may not have control over some of the things that are happening. And we can check in with what we do have control over. And that is the reaction that we're having. So that inner ease can help us find what the next best thing to do is. It settles the mind and emotions before moving into difficult conversation. Uh, as you see, it creates a conscious space for double checking our intentions. Because sometimes if we're, if we're in that chronic depleting emotion, we may, be, we may be really developing plans to get back at somebody or you know, we're gonna go tell somebody else that that was just not right. And, and again, there may be a need for communication, but we want to pay attention. What emotion am I in when I'm expressing that? Am I depleting myself or have I found this place of um, choosing to be clear and, uh, and communicate in a way that is more effective? All right. So breathe these to pause and settle the mind and emotions. Um, yeah, I think we've got all that. Okay. So just moving into a couple slides about understanding a little bit about the Institute of Heart Math. Um, we 
we learned from heart math something that had been known since the 1800s, but they really started doing the research around this to, to help us understand what that means, that the heart sends far more information to the brain. And that's where all their emotional um, research came from. Patterns in the neural signals from the heart especially affect the brain centers involved in perception, emotional experience, and self-regulation. So these are, again, a couple of tools. Do I have control? That's something you can ask yourself. Create your choice point. Three of these. Determine what you have control of and take an action or a more effective attitude. And then what's the next best thing to do right now? Maybe that's what you can ask yourself or just say to yourself, just one thing right now with that number one unrealistic workload. Maybe there's times in the day where you feel like you're, you're in the middle of trying to get five things done. Just one thing right now. So let yourself ease into that. All right, so we're going to just take a, a poll related to inner resources. So my wonderful co-producers in the background, there we go. All of the above. Excellent. All right. All right. Great. Lots of exercisers out there. Excellent. Yeah. Um, you know, exercise for so many reasons. There can be camaraderie and connection if we're doing it with other people. If you're like me, I was more of a loner exercise. I would be able to think things out. I studied a lot of um, uh, chemistry in my day. And I remember I used to run long runs and be thinking about the formulas. <laughs> and then when I got into the workplace, um, really, you know, just kind of working things out in my head, just getting it out. Yeah. So really knowing your inner resources is important and keeping a, a toolkit. Um, and on that note, what you see on the screen is a URL, and I am going to uh, have that put into the chat box for you. That is a gift from HeartMath right now of a, of a nine chapter video series that has five different skills. So we just did one. So I recommend everybody go out and grab that, watch it with your families. Um, yeah. So really what we're up to is changing those signals to the brain to a more coherent um, signal so that we, again, are affecting the centers involved in decision-making, foresight, social awareness, and our ability to self-regulate. So I am just going, let me check time. Okay, let me just do two more slides, three more slides, and really look at the impact. So what you see on the screen is an emotional grid. So look at the ones on the right. Those are those are renewing emotions that help us charge during the day. On the left, we have depleting emotions. And what we know from our science, from heart math, I love this graphic. Our thoughts and emotions affect the heart's magnetic field, which energetically affects those in our environment. So, you know, sometimes we feel a little helpless, but I always remember this, and I remember that when I take on a facilitative state, a coherent state in myself, all of these are available to not only me, but those in my workplace with me. So if, if helpless is one of those emotions, uh, that's an emotion that lives here. If that is an emotion that is starting to occur to you more chronically, I really, I really encourage you to work with 
bringing ease to there's so much work with gratitude and appreciation. Uh, so just start working little baby steps at a time with gratitude and appreciation. And remember that you do, it's kind of like, it's kind of like that. We are affecting ourselves, our own physiology, and we are affecting those around us. All right, so I am gonna end there so that we have a little bit of time for Q and A. Let me stop share. There we go. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Yasin, um, if you may come back on camera, you can also. And let's see if anybody has any more questions that they wanna add, if you can go to the Q and A box at the bottom of your Zoom room and add any questions that you have for Michelle and Yasin. I can go ahead and start going through them now. So the first question, um, and it says this is a big question, <laughs> um, but as a researcher and parent outside of the school system, what are things that I can do to support school employees in both the short and long term? And feel free to answer um, both of you and call just one whoever wants to answer. Whoops, I was reading that again uh, and it went away. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, as a researcher and parent outside of the school system, what are things that I can do to support school employees in both the short and long term? Sure, so I can, I can start. Um, I think that's a really good question. Uh, one thing that everyone can do kind of regardless of um, whether or not you have children in the school system is um, pay attention to uh, who we're voting for, right? Like public education, spending has a huge impact on um, the workers who are uh, who, who are kind of on the receiving end of that funding right and and um, with the teacher strikes across the country that we saw it really um, was so inspiring to see parents um, community members really coming out in support and letting um, their elected officials know the school board members know like we care about, uh, school employees and we understand that schools are the heart of our communities and we are here to stand in solidarity with them. So um, I think kind of finding this, the school employee, maybe unions or groups that are in your area and kind of looking to them directly, asking them like, how can we support you um, in specific ways, particularly around contract time or bargaining, uh, when bargaining is happening, but in a broader sense, um, really paying attention to, again, like the, the bigger picture of what's going on, how are things being funded, um, who's in elected office and, and do their values align with, with your values. Yeah, yeah, great. And, and I would dovetail on that too with this idea of the more that we can connect community resources, um, there's so much, there really are resources that are <clears throat> available. I'm in the Sacramento County area. <clears throat> One of the things I just saw is a, a huge grant, huge, wonderful <laughs> grant for children's mental health. So, you know, watching and seeing and recognizing, okay, let's make sure those that need that actually know about this and, and talk about it, get it in our newsletters, um, and provide, provide connections to community uh, resources so that there's a collaboration of efforts going on. Thank you both so much. That's both critical answers. And I'm sure everybody really appreciates all of the expertise that you are bringing to the table and to the conversation right now. Um, I'll go ahead and move on to another question. Um, do you provide information on workers' compensation for COVID survivors as far as mental health? And to clarify, those who were exposed to COVID positive coworker students and others who were infected with COVID. Mm. I have to say in my organization, I'm, I'm, that, is, that is an area of, uh, I don't have that information um, in my organization, how that is being managed. It's a good, it's a good question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll just add to that, that, um, you know, workers' compensation does cover um, mental health 
issues. Um, workers' compensation is a pretty complicated system, um, but I know that there are there is a, an information resource line um, that, uh, at least in California, that we have. I'm not sure if there's uh, if there's how it, you know kind of different states have different plans, um, but that could be a really great starting point. Um, so that is is a number that I can look up and get over to Jessica. And so that can um, hopefully be included with the resources link tomorrow. Just to point out again, that we will be sending out resources tomorrow uh, with the, uh, the link to the recording. So any of this, the websites that you see on here and such, we'll pull out that way they'll be easy to find and access when you have time. Um, so thanks again. And let's see, next question. Um, any research done on the success of these techniques on persons who were in deep stress? I think that probably was while you were talking about it, but let me know if you, um, that was during yours, Michelle. Oh, the heart mouth. Absolutely. If you go to the heart mouth, there's a heartmouth.com and a heartmouth.org. If you go to heartmouth.org, there are loads and loads and loads. It's amazing how much research this organization has done. Yeah, lots available. Yeah. Great, thank you. And let's see, any ideas on how to promote regular check-ins for mental health support for staff? I can tell you one of the things that has occurred for us in our organization from a, from a check-in standpoint with our regular meetings, um, what's been added with our director is that question, how are you doing? <laughs> Remembering that this very important aspect of we are all human beings dealing with these massive changes, um, lots of loss, uh, and all of that comes with us to the workplace. And the more that managers and supervisors can invite just sharing about that. And it has become a very safe because we know it is just a held concern. That question comes out of how are you doing and can I support you? And that's a really important thing for all, all of you managing or supervising staff. Find some way to allow for that to happen so that it feels in that safe, supportive way. It's, you know, and when we do it, it's also connected with, oh my gosh, this dog, this new puppy that I have is keeping me up all night. You know, it's it's all of it. It's the whole human beingness of us, all of it that's happening. So then being able to share all of those things that are happening um, good and not so good on a human level. And here's what I'm working on this week. <laughs> so. Those are all really great points. I would I'm just underline everything that Michelle just said. Um, it's so important, right, to, to understand that we're all whole people, right? And um, part of the issue with this uh, kind of ever increasing productivity is that it feels, it can feel like there's no time for um, kind of that human connection and, and the value of building relationships, building trust, checking in with people, right? Having, um, having an understanding that everyone has so much going on and um, that we can really support each other. We're such an amazing resource um, to each other and to our colleagues um, and, and to really kind of push back against this idea of like what productivity actually is, right? And how meaningful it is when we, um, when we do create safe spaces where people can bring their whole selves into work, there are really um, incredible uh, like changes that that can make. Thank you. And that actually really leads into the next question that we have is how can somebody get their employer to understand mental health is critical to a safe school? You know, <clears throat> what first occurs for me there, um, because I know that we have really been dialing into all the resources available to us through EAP. Employee assistance programs can probably be very helpful in that regard, um, connecting uh, employers, um, they many many EAPs have um, employee uh, services. 
they also have support and work that is specific to um, supervisors, managers, um, and those um, that, you know, oftentimes they may, may not recognize um, fully um, why a uh, performance problem is occurring and they may, that's where an EAP program can be really helpful in bringing that knowledge and understanding um, to employers. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Another idea could be to um, conduct an employee survey, right? I think being able to really show that, it, you know, it, it can be easy if, if one person is kind of um, outwardly struggling than for all of the other people who are also struggling, but it might not be in such an, op in, in, in a way that other people are seeing or recognizing. It's really easy for issues um, of stress and mental health to just completely be under the radar. And so trying to um, bring some transparency to that and, and kind of really underscore the ways that this is, this is um, there can, well, this is an individual issue and can definitely take those forms. There is a larger um, kind of issue at hand here. And here's some evidence that we have because we've, we've talked to our coworkers and here are some potential solutions that, that we've thought about, right? And if you have a union, if you have a health and safety committee, um, that could be a good avenue to um, kind of carry that idea forward. And if you don't, it could be a, a time to maybe think about starting one. Great, thank you. And there is one more question. It's, it's pretty long, but I wanted to point, pull out something that I felt like was really relevant to the conversation. And um, have you seen any long-term effects of tolerating all of this stress at work and, and maybe what some of those implications are? And are there any labor rules regarding such behaviors? Because again, thinking about mental health versus physical safety, maybe they're a little bit different in what your thoughts are on those. Yeah. Um, well, to start with the individual effects, um, going back to that very first slide, you know, that Yassine shared when those stay very chronic and muscle tension becomes very chronic and some of the physical ailments um, become more chronic that, that often I know that, you know, oftentimes that, that is where a workers' compensation claim may arise, that may start the conversation. Uh, what are long-term tolerance? I, I think long-term tolerance affects, if you're meaning in the physical, um, this, now we're starting to get into the trauma, the world of trauma. And <clears throat> so really paying attention to being able to find some level, even if it's just one breath, even if it's just, you know, because what the ACE is, this starts to be a very big conversation indeed. <laughs> what we know with the ACEs study, adverse childhood uh, events, and, you know, and what we carry forward in our own personal history may start to be trigger, triggered. So we each have this personal history also. Um, uh, let's see if I can wrap in one. Uh, I, and I have to say again, because my specialty is, is not labor rules. Um, that's not an area that I can bring knowledge to. Um, but yes, very important personally to to find some way to start bringing assistance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would just add to that that I see in this question, there's this, um, you know, like what can individuals do if if they're not able to achieve ease through, um, I think, the, for through breathing techniques um, or, or other things that might be helpful to other people. And I think that it is, it's really, um, important to, like Michelle's saying, to figure out individually, right? So that might be calling a friend, that might be going for a walk, that might be, um, you know, like having a really good cup of coffee alone to yourself every morning before you, um, get into work or to just, you know, like 
if you have an office door, be able to close it and just have three minutes to listen to your favorite song alone, right? Like it, 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 I think it's, it's less important what the action is and more important, like Michelle was talking about that, like it's bringing you some, some ease. And so um, thinking about like when you are able to step outside of that stress, when is that, you know, what are those things that can be helpful for you? Um, and I think I lost the, um, the original question, <laughs> Michelle, I'm sorry that you asked. Oh, so the other part of the question, so that was all part of it. And then just, um, especially Yassin, with the work that you do, are you aware of any labor rules that kind of connect with, um, with this topic? Yeah, definitely. So um, there, with <clears throat> hazards in general, it's, it's going to be easier to have something that is really straightforward, right? So when we're talking about like, here is a hazardous chemical and it does all of these terrible things to the body and how do we fix it? Get that chemical out of the workplace and get a better one and, you know, right? Like it, it's, it's much easier to be dealing with um, things like that that are really tangible and concrete. And when we're thinking about mental health in the workplace, um, it's, it's harder, right? Because it's not so concrete but we do have like the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission, right? That protects um, people from discrimination on like certain classes, right? That's a huge, um, that adds into workplace stress for so many people on the basis of race and sex and pregnancy discrimination and religion, right? And so that is definitely a place where we have um, specific laws. Um, and, and again, I would say this is another place where union contracts can be really helpful, right? We know that, that laws are very slow and they really lag behind the needs of workers and union contracts can be so helpful because they're, they're kind of hyper-local. And when you're at the bargaining table, you can say like, this is what our workers are dealing with. This is our priority. And we're going to create some rules, right? Some, some like hyper-local laws that are going to dictate like, what, um, how to address these, these behaviors that are causing so much stress. Absolutely, thank you so much for that. And um, I will, if there's any questions that we didn't get to, I'll go ahead and send them an email to Michelle and Yassine because we are definitely over time. And um, if they have any feedback, I can always add that in the resources. But again, I just wanted to thank both of you for coming today and, and sharing all of this really impactful information. I think that most people can say that they can relate to this very heavily right now. Um, again, everybody's going to get an email tomorrow that has a link to the um, certificate uh, link, which is through an evaluation, and also a link to the resources and um, in the recording. So again, thank you so much, Yassine and Michelle, for being here. If anybody has any more questions, um, please feel free to contact COEHCE at berkeley.edu. Also, you can find out more about upcoming webinars and such at coeh.berkeley.edu backslash about CE. So again, thank you everybody for being here. Have a good day. Yeah, great. Bye everybody. Thank you so much.